Next topic is Sodi and Fijin Displacement Law. They are called as alpha decay or beta alpha decay and beta decay. First we are going to see alpha decay that is nothing but radioactive element emit alpha particle a daughter nucleus is formed. Okay, so unstable parent nucleus for example this unstable parent nucleus emit alpha particle they will form a daughter nucleus stable daughter nucleus is called as alpha particle so what will happen during this reaction whenever there is alpha decay so mass number is reduced by 4 units atomic number is reduced by 2 units so that we can form one alpha particle that is called as alpha decay right so radioactive element emits alpha particle a daughter nucleus is formed Mass number reduced by 4, atomic number reduced by, four, um, reduced by 2. So uranium 92 to 238, mass number is 238, that is reduced by 4 units, it will become 234. Here 92 reduced to 90, that's it. So it will form alpha particle or it can call it as alpha decay. Beta particle, that is the same. So mass number, there will not be any change, but atomic number is increased by 1. Atomic number is increased by 1 that is called as beta decay. So this is a parent nucleus beta decay the same way here there will not be any change in the mass number there will be change in the atomic number. So atomic number increased by 1 mass number there is no change so minus 1 electron. So this negative value that is beta decay. So finally we are going to see alpha decay that is no change in the atomic and mass number there will be change in the energy okay in the gamma rays okay in the gamma rays there will be some changes in the energy level there will not be any change in the atomic number or the mass number so this is the important three uh, things that we have to know one is alpha decay, beta decay, gamma decay so whenever you see alpha decay mass number reduced by 4 atomic number reduced by 2 the uh, beta decay there is no change in the mass number but there is one number is increased in the atomic number in the gamma decay there is no change in the mass number of the atomic number so this is beta and gamma radiation as alpha particles consist of two protons and two neutrons like the nucleus of a helium atom we generally represent them like this as helium 4,2 although you might sometimes see them as the Greek letter alpha instead. So when an unstable nucleus, like uranium-238, undergoes alpha decay and emits one of these alpha particles, it's going to lose two protons and two neutrons. To show this, we have to subtract 4 from its mass number and 2 from its atomic number. So uranium-238 would go to form something with a mass number of 234 and an atomic number of 90. Because the atomic number has changed, it will now be a different element. So we'd have to check the periodic table to find out that it's now thorium. The last thing is to add our helium that was emitted, and then just double check that the mass and atomic numbers on each side of the equation are the same overall. So if we had a question that asked us to write the equation for the alpha decay of radium-226, which has an atomic number of 88, we would start with our radium-226 and draw an arrow to our unknown decay product and our alpha particle, which we write as a helium nucleus. Then to figure out what our decay product is, we subtract 4 from the 226 to get a mass number of 222, and minus 2 from the 88, to get an atomic number of 86. Then all we have to do is check the periodic table to figure out what element it is. So in this case, radon. Now, beta decay is a bit more complicated, because it involves a neutron turning into a proton and emitting a fast-moving electron which is the beta particle. So if carbon-14 was to decay and emit one of these electrons, then because it's effectively gained a proton, its atomic number would increase from 6 to 7, making it nitrogen rather than carbon. 
However, its mass number would stay the same, because although it's gained a proton, it also lost a neutron. So it still only has a total of 14 protons and neutrons in its nucleus. Just like with the alpha particle, you can also represent the beta particle with an actual beta symbol. But either way, we have to put a minus 1 at the bottom to show that it has a charge of minus 1, and a 0 at the top to show that its mass is pretty much 0. The easiest type of radiation to show is gamma radiation. Because gamma radiation is pure energy and doesn't have any mass or charge, it doesn't change anything. So if our thorium-234 from earlier underwent gamma decay, it would just go to form thorium-234 again, plus a gamma ray, which we show with the Greek letter gamma. Units of radioactivity. So here we are going to use four units. One is Curie, second one is Rutherford, third one is Becquerel, fourth one is Bronchen. There are four units. First one, so they may ask in the examination, already is there Bronchen. Different one Bronchen, that is book back question. So they may ask in the examination. If they ask book inside, they may ask uh, definition of Curie, Rutherford or Becquerel. So it's very simple uh, to explain it. So one theory, how can we define that is quantity of radioactive substance which undergoes 3.7 10 power into 10 power 10 disintegration per second is called as one theory. So one theory is defined as 3.7 into 10 power 10 disintegration per second. That is one theory. So value of one theory, they may ask in an object is also. So 1 curie is equal to 3.7 to 10 power 10 disintegration per second. So root the fourth, that symbol is R V can be used. So radiative substance which produce 10 power 6 disintegration per second. Okay, so 10 power 6 disintegration per second is called as 1 root the fourth. 1 R V is equal to 10 power 6 disintegration per second. Third one is Becquerel. So Henry Becquerel in the name that is BQ, that is Becquerel, that is the SI unit of radioactivity. SI unit they may ask is very important. So other units is not SI unit. So Henry Becquerel is called as SI unit. So BQ can be used, the letters BQ can be used. How can we define that is the quantity of one disintegration per second is called as one Becquerel. Quantity of one disintegration per second is called as one Becquerel, that is SI unit. So SI unit is called radioactivity is Henry Becker or you can write Becker. So the fourth one is Rongen, that is symbol is R. It's a book back question. So radioactive substance produce a charge of 2.58 in 10 power minus 7 coulomb in 1 kilogram of air at standard temperature and pressure. And standard temperature, pressure and humidity is called as one rongin, one rongin radiative substance produces a charge of 2.58 in 10 power minus 4 coulomb in 1 kilogram of air at standard temperature, pressure and humidity is called as one rongin, very important to mark look back question. So these are the four units will be used for measuring uh, radioactivity. Okay, so rongins will be used to find uh, radiation of X-ray or gamma rays. Okay, so we can measure how much X-rays can be used. That will be used as bronchin. So one theory is quantity of radiative substance which undergo 3.7 in 10 power 10, 10 power 10 disintegration per second is called one theory. That is 3.7 in 10 power 10 disintegration per second. And the fourth the symbol is RT. Radiative substance which undergo or which produce 10 power 6 disintegration in one second, one R is equal to 10 power 6 disintegration per one second. Henry Becker is called as SI unit, that symbol is BQ, quantity of one disintegration per second. That's it. So, Rongen will be used for measuring uh, the radiation like X rays and gamma rays. And uh, radiative substance produce a charge of 2.58 in 10 power minus 4 coulomb in 1 kilogram of air at standard temperature, pressure, and humidity is called as. One drawn jet. So now we are going to discuss about nuclear fission. 
nuclear fission is a simple method fission means splitting up into two so here we have, whenever we have uranium bombarded with neutron it split into two smaller nuclei plus three neutron and energy will be released this process is called as nuclear fission so uranium is heavier nucleus bombarded with neutron will be releasing barium plus krypton they are called as smaller nuclei nucleus and nuclei nucleus is singular and nuclei is plural form so barium and krypton is called as smaller nuclei along with that we are going to have three more neutrons plus energy will be released this is called as nuclear fission reaction so nuclear fission is nothing but uranium nucleus is bombarded with a neutron it break up into smaller nuclei plus few neutrons is nothing but three neutrons will be released along with that energy also will be released this entire process is called as nuclear fission right so here we are going to discuss about the material which is used here is uranium 235 is called as fissionable material the material which absorbs the uranium in a sustained manner the reaction will take place so this uranium 235 will be used as fissionable material so for example radioisotopes like uranium 238 uranium 235 so uranium 235 will be acting as fissionable material uranium 238 will not be acting as fissionable material right so uranium 235 is called as fissionable material okay next topic that is chain reaction chain reaction the same thing that we have to remember whenever you have uranium nucleus bombarded with neutron we know very well three neutron will be released plus two nuclei will be released plus energy also will be released so now what will happen in the chain reaction the three neutron again bombarded with three uranium it will be releasing nine neutron so again that nine neutron will be bombarded with nine uranium it will be releasing 27 neutron so it will be continuing like gp geometrical progression right so it will be continuing as gp method so the uranium will be keep on increasing to 3 the 9 27 will go on okay so that is called as chain reaction that is called as chain reaction so uranium bombarded with neutron will be releasing 3 neutron the three neutron again bombarded with the three uh, uranium it will be releasing nine neutron again nine neutron will be bombarded with three sorry nine uh, uranium it will be releasing 27 neutron it will go on this is called as chain reaction so in chain reaction we have two types one is controlled chain reaction other one is uncontrolled chain reaction what is called controlled chain reaction is very simple the same case the same example will be used uranium plus neutrons for example uranium have to take and bombarded with neutron it will be releasing three neutron plus two uh, nuclei plus energy will be released right so here what happens in controlled chain reaction we have three neutron the three neutron should be reduced as one right so two neutron should be absorbed by using neutron absorber when you absorb this two neutron we have rest only one right the one neutron again bombarded with uranium will be releasing three so what will happen again we have absorbed these two then again uranium will be used you will be getting three neutron again you have to absorb it will go off right so that is called as when neutron maintained to be one so neutron should be maintained as one so that the reaction will be in complete controlled reaction so neutron absorber is used to control the reaction sustained and controlled chain reaction so this is called as sustained and controlled chain reaction it will be used for constructive purposes like producing current and other purposes what is called uncontrolled chain reaction here there is no control with neutron when number of neutron increases what will happen the reaction rate will increase and the reaction rate will increase the amount of energy also will increase so it will be this is called as uncontrolled chain reaction so neutron multiplies indefinitely so we are not able to have any control with the neutron for example uranium 
bombarded with neutron, it will be releasing three neutron. Again, it will go on 9, 27, as we have seen in the uh, chain reaction, right? So it will go on. So what will happen here? Enormous amount of energy will be released in a fraction of a second. So huge amount of energy released it used in the atom bomb. So these are the main application of uncontrolled chain reaction because when we put atom bomb, it will produce a lot of energy in within a second, right? So that is called as uncontrolled chain reaction it's because we are not control the number of neutron here. The number of neutron will be multiplying, so we not have any control over neutron. But in con uh, control chain reaction, we are going to control the neutron. When we control the neutron, what will happen? The reaction rate will decrease, the amount of energy also will decrease. So we can use it for a constructive purposes, for producing current and other purposes, right? So these are the very important topics, that is control chain reaction and uncontrolled chain reaction. So once again, I repeat, nuclear fission is nothing but uranium bombarded with neutron, it will be releasing uh, which will split into two smaller nuclei plus few neutrons plus energy will be released which is called as nuclear fission. Fission is nothing but splitting up into two. So chain reaction is nothing but uranium bombarded with neutron it will be releasing three neutrons plus nuclei plus energy. So here what happens that neutron will be increasing which means that it will be multiplying right. So three neutron again bombarded with three uh, uranium it will become nine then 9 into 3 again 27 it will go on. So this is what uh, is called as uh, chain reaction. So another uh, the type, one is controlled chain reaction, another one is uncontrolled chain reaction. In the controlled chain reaction, we are going to control the number of neutrons so that what will happen? We can slow down the reaction rate. Uncontrolled chain reaction, we are not controlling the number of neutrons. So automatically that reaction rate will increase. So we will get lot of energy within a second. So this uh, principle is used in an atom bomb. Which is the splitting up of a large and unstable nuclei into smaller nuclei. At the same time, it releases loads of energy, which is how we get all of our nuclear energy here on Earth. Now, nuclear fission can occur in two different ways either spontaneously, where the fission is unforced and happens all by itself, or by absorbing a neutron, which can effectively split a nucleus by making it even less stable. In practice, spontaneous fission is rare, and so when we use fission in nuclear reactors, we have to use neutrons to get the process started. To understand how the process works, Let's go through the steps. As we said, we start off with a large unstable nuclei, like uranium-235, and we fire a relatively slow-moving neutron at it. This addition of a neutron to the nucleus makes it even less stable, and causes it to split apart into two smaller nuclei, that we call daughter nuclei. It also releases two or three more neutrons, and importantly, loads of energy in the form of gamma radiation. Each of the neutrons can then go on to repeat the process all over again with another uranium nuclei. And so more daughter nuclei, energy, and neutrons will be released, which again allows the process to start over. Now, the key point of this process is that nuclear fission leads to a chain reaction where the first fission can trigger more fission, which can in turn trigger even more fission, and so on. If this process isn't controlled properly, then the whole system can quickly get out of control and release huge amounts of energy, which is exactly what happens in a nuclear bomb. In nuclear reactors, though, the rate of fission has to be carefully controlled to stop it from getting out of control. This is mainly achieved by control rods, which can be lowered into the reactor to absorb neutrons, and so slow down the reaction. Meanwhile, the energy released from the process is used to heat up water and turn it into steam, which can then drive turbines that are connected to an electricity generator. 
we discuss about critical mass as we discussed in the nuclear fission reaction whenever there is fission reaction there will be three neutron will be released right so the all the three neutrons will not be available for further fission reaction so what will happen in this new uh, three neutron some neutron may be absorbed by the non fissionable material which are available in the system some may escape so we have to have sustained uh, reaction fission reaction so we have to increase we have to uh, have a particular mass of a fission fissile material right so we have to keep a particular level of a uh, fissile material that minimum mass of fissile material necessary to sustain the chain reaction is called as critical mass critical mass is very important to our question minimum mass of fissile material so we have to maintain the number of neutron that is 3 so we have to increase the mass of fissile material right so minimum mass of fissile material necessary to do sustain a chain reaction is called as critical mass we have two types one is sub critical mass another one is super critical mass sub critical mass something but mass of fissile material is less than critical mass is called as sub critical mass of fissile material is more than uh, critical mass is called as super critical mass it's very important to one question so they will ask define critical mass that is minimum mass of fissile material necessary to sustain a chain reaction is called as nuclear fusion it's very simple topic nuclear fusion is nothing but two lighter nuclei combined to form a heavier nucleus is called as nuclear fusion for example hydrogen hydrogen they are called lighter nuclei they combine together and form heavier nucleus is called as nuclear fusion fusion is joining two lighter nuclei and they are getting one heavier nucleus is called as nuclear fusion along with that there will be some energy released okay so this one h2 isotope is called as uh, hydrogen isotope is called as a deuterium deuterium we can call it as so what are the condition for uh, obtaining this reaction that is temperature temperature should be 10 power 7 to 10 power 9 kelvin maintained and high pressure should be maintained right so temperature value should be 10 power 7 to 10 power 9 kelvin should be maintained to achieve nuclear fusion reaction with high pressure so these conditions should be uh, should be maintained for getting this nuclear fusion reaction so nuclear fusion reaction uh, will take place in sun and other stars okay they are called as stellar energy surface temperature of stars is very high is sufficient to induce fusion of hydrogen that in our world there are a lot of hydrogen uh, present in stars and sun so what will happen I'll already we know that there will be more temperature in stars and sun so that is enough to induce which means that they fuse uh, this hydrogen right so fusion reaction takes place in the core of sun and stars result to produce enormous amount of energy is called as stellar energy okay so this very important kumar question they will ask in book back question actually this is fusion reaction take place in the core of sun and the other stars results produce enormous amount of energy so as we know the condition necessary for nuclear fusion 10 power 7 to 10 power 9 why we have to maintain 10 power 7 to 10 power 9 is because we have two positive uh, isotope hydrogen right so when you have positive we have to make we have to combine them right so we have to maintain more temperature so that we can combine otherwise we are not able to combine these hydrogen ions right so that is the uh, main purpose of having 10 power 9 7 to 10 power 9 kelvin should be maintained so automatically go larger nuclei for example two hydrogen nuclei like hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 2 could fuse together to form helium 3 this process releases absolutely tons of energy and is a process that fuels stars. It's also how all elements heavier than hydrogen were made. The reason fusion produces such large amounts of energy is that some of the mass of the original nuclei, in this case those two hydrogens, is being converted to energy rather than transferred to the new helium nucleus. You can't tell this from looking at the mass numbers, but just trust us that the helium nuclei will be very slightly lighter 
than the total mass of the two hydrogen nuclei. You don't need to be able to calculate this energy in any way, but out of interest, it is converted by Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation, which tells us that you multiply the mass that's being lost by the speed of light squared to work out how much energy it will be converted to. And as the speed of light squared is around 9 times 10 to the power of 16, you can see why a lot of energy is released. Another great thing about nuclear fusion is that it doesn't produce any radioactive waste, and we can easily make the hydrogen that's needed as a fuel. The issue though is that fusion only happens at really high temperatures and pressures, as in 10 million degrees Celsius. Because of this, we can't currently do nuclear fusion here on Earth, but there is a lot of experimental research going into discovering how we could do it one day. The last thing I want to say is don't get nuclear fusion confused with nuclear fission. Nuclear fusion, which we've been talking about in this video, is the fusing of light nuclei to make heavier nuclei and releases tons of energy. But it only happens inside stars because of the high temperatures and pressures that are required. Nuclear fission, on the other hand, is when large unstable nuclei are split into two smaller nuclei. This still produces lots of energy, but nowhere near as much as fusion. And it's nuclear fission that we use here on Earth to generate electricity. Okay, now we are going to discuss about uses of radioactivity. So agriculture uses medicine, industries, and archaeological research. In agricultural product, first one is P32, that is phosphorus 32, increase productivity of crops. So that is the main purpose of uh, phosphorus 32. Other than that, we are going to use some radiations, kill insects, parasites, and prevent wastage of agriculture products. Okay, so third point that is small dosage of radiations prevent sprouting spoilage of onion, potatoes, and uh, grams and go on, right? So these are the main purpose of uh, these radiations in agriculture. And finally, uh, medicines that we are going to see, five important uh, uses. First one is sodium, Na24, functioning of heart, iodine-131, cure, uh, goiter, and FP-59, treatment of anemia, and phosphorus-32, skin disease, and cobalt 60 is a skin cancer. These are the main important five uh, uses of medicine. Okay. So in this case, there are plenty of uses. First one is californium in airlines. If there is any uh, detect the explosives in uh, luggages. If they uh, bring any luggage with the explosives, you can easily find out with the help of californium. And MLCM is a smoke uh, detector used in the industries. At the same time, some kind of radiation will be used as finding cracks and the leakages uh, in the manufacturers uh, things. Uh, and finally, archaeological department that is uh, carbon dating method, age of fossils, age of the earth, and paintings and the monuments, many things can be find uh, the age and other things using this uh, carbon dating method and the other things using using what. Finally, archaeological research, carbon dating method, first one, second, age of the earth, fossils and paintings, monuments, all these can be uh, find with the use of radiations. So these are the uh, main uh, functions and uh, uses of uh, radioactivity methods. So agriculture, medicines, industries and archaeological research, these all these five points are very important, they may ask in an objective. What is this? Atom bomb is based on the principle of uncontrolled fission chain reaction. The natural uranium consists of 99.28% of uranium-238 and 0.72% of uranium-235. It's really lesser. So uranium-238 is the fissionable only by a fast neutron. It is essential in a bomb that either uranium-235 or plutonium-239 should be used because they are fissionable by neutrons of 
any energy or all energies. An atom bomb consists of two hemispheres of uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Each is smaller than the critical size and are kept apart by a separator aperture. When the bomb has to be exploded, a third will fitting a cylinder of uranium-235, whose mass is always are also less than the critical masses propel so that it fuses together with the other two pieces. Now, the total quantity is greater than the critical mass and uncontrolled chain reaction takes place. Inside, resulting in a terrific explosion. The explosion of an atom bomb releases tremendous amount of energy in the form of heat light and radiations, temperatures of millions of degrees Celsius and pressure of millions of atmosphere are produced. Such explosion produces shock waves. The release of dangerously radioactive gamma rays, neutrons and radioactive materials produces a health hazard over the surrounding for a very long time. You are able to see the impact. So, I am trying to show you the explosion which happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. These bombs were used in World War II and were exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. We are quite familiar with the amount of distraction and assaults. Hydrogen bomb The principle of nuclear fusion is used in hydrogen bomb. It is an explosive device to release a very large amount of energy by the fusion of light nuclei. The temperature required for the purpose of fusion is produced by fission reactions. The explosion of an atom bomb produces temperature of the order of 50 million degrees Celsius. The fusion reaction in hydrogen bomb is given as follows. The RP International Commission on Radiological Protection, the safe limit is 20 millisiever per year in Ronchen, that is 100 MR per uh, week. If exposure is 100 or MR is a milli Ronchen, 100 or cause cancer. If it is 600 or leads to death. And this is already is there in book back question. So, prevention measures. So, whenever we handle radioactive material, that should be kept in the thick lead box or lead container. So, all the material should be placed. So, radioactive material should be kept in lead box. Second one, lead coated aprons and gloves can be used. So, all the material should be uh, in the lead coated aprons, gloves should be used. Avoid looting when you are handling radioactive material. Okay, material can be handled by tongs or remote control. Remote control should be used. We are not able to handle an empty hand or uh, just like that we can't uh, enter into uh, radioactive material uh, in that uh, place. So we have to follow all this instruction uh, carefully. And dosimeter should be used. Dosimeter is the instrument used to find uh, the radiation level. How much radiation is affected in the body when you wear it's like watch. We can easily identify uh, how much radiation has passed in our body. Okay, so radiation exposed in the body can be measured by dosimeter. So dosimeter should be worn when you are entering into the radioactive material room. Okay, so these are the five uh, important measures should be taken when you are entering into the radioactive uh, room. Okay, so radioactive material kept in the lead box and uh, lead coated aprons, gloves can be used to avoid heating while handling radioactive material. Material can be handled by or remote controls and dosimeters should be used to find their Tops have wide application in medicine, agriculture, industry and research. A radio isotope is added to a particular system and the course of the isotope is studied to understand the system. This is the picture of a MRI scanning, a three dimensional view of MRI scanning. 
for which the radio activity is used. You are able to scan the details. The application of radio isotopes are medical applications, agriculture, molecular biology, industries and radiocarbon dating. So the agriculture in agriculture is used to save the fruits. Radio isotope is used in industry for monitoring the content of food. And we'll talk about the carbon dating, radio carbon dating in future things. In case of medical field, radio isotope are used both in diagnosis and therapy. Radio cobalt emitting gamma rays is used in the treatment of cancers. Gamma rays destroy cancer cells to a greater extent. Radio sodium is used to detect the presence of blocks in the blood vessels to check the effective functioning of heart in pumping blood and maintaining circulation. Your radio sodium is used. Radio iodine is used in the detection of the nature of thyroid gland and also for treatment. Radio iodine is also used to locate the brain tumors. Radio iron is used to diagnose the anemic anemia. An anemic patient retains iron in the blood longer than normal patient. Radio phosphorus is used in the treatment of skin cancers too and skin diseases. So this is the grading of anemia given by WHO. In agriculture, radio isotopes helps to increase the crop yields. Radio phosphorus incorporated with a phosphate fertilizer is added to the soil. The plant and soil are tested from time to time. Phosphorus is taken by the plant for its growth and radio phosphorus is found to increase the yield. I am trying to check it out, the growth of the plant using axonometer. Sprouting and spoilage of onions, potatoes, grams are prevented by exposure to a very small extent of radiations. Certain perishable cereals remain fresh beyond their normal lifespan when exposed to radiation. In industry, the lubricating oil contains radioisotopes and it is used to study the wear and tear of the machineries. In molecular biology, radioisotopes are used in sterilizing the pharmaceutical and surgical instruments. Very important summer question. First nuclear uh, reactor was built in 1942 at Chicago in USA. Right. So in the nuclear reactor, we have uh, many types of nuclear reactor. So in the common nuclear reactor should have these five uh, components. First one is fuel. So always fuel will be used as uranium. Okay, uranium will be used as a fuel. So uranium is the main uh, thing that we have to use in the nuclear reactor. Second one is moderator will use slow down high energy neutrons to provide slow neutrons. What are the moderator could be used? Graphite and heavy water, very important objective. Graphite and heavy water will be acting as a moderator and we have control rod. Control rod, what is the use of control rod? Control the neutrons. So neutrons will be controlled by the control rod, which means they can absorb. Uh, so boron and cadmium rod will be used as a control rod. Coolant, as you know very well, whenever there is a nuclear uh, reactor, nuclear reaction, there will be lot of energy, heat energy will be released. So remove heat energy from core to produce steam. Uh, some coolant will be used like water, air and helium. So this steam will be uh, used to uh, run the turbine and we can produce electricity also. So protection wall that is uh, lead wall will be used as you know very well, lead should be used uh, as a protection wall. So these are five components should be 
used for nuclear reactor first one is fuel uranium will be acting as a fuel moderator slow down high energy neutron to uh, slow neutron that is graphite and heavy water control rods boron and cadmium is used to control the neutrons coolant remove heat from the core to uh, provide or produce steam that steam will be used as a uh, run the turbine and we can produce more current also so water air helium these are the three uh, things will be used for cooling finally production wall that lead wall will be uh, is built around the reactor so we can if there is any problem that lead will not allow nuclear reactors are the modern day devices which are used extensively for generation of power earlier we used coal and other non renewable sources for the purpose of power generation but since we are running out of them at a very rapid pace we need to look at sustainable and possible and eco friendly way of moving forward the nuclear reactor consists of three core components fuel elements moderator control rods fuel elements consists of cylindrical rods put into bundles a uranium oxide ceramic is formed into pellets and inserted into zircloy tubes that are bundled together and contain fissionable nuclei of uranium 235 or uranium 238 the number of rods varies greatly according to the size of the reactor the fuel elements are placed inside the reactor core The fuel elements are immersed in water which act as a moderator. Moderator is essential in slowing down the energy in neutrons in nuclear reactors which are produced during the fission process by the fuel elements. Normal or heavy water is generally used as a moderator. Thermal neutrons produce fission reaction with uranium 235 and during this process New neutrons are given out which have the energy of about 1 MeV or 1 mega electron volts. These new neutrons typically escape from other fission process as they are accompanied by huge energy with them. Here moderators come into play. Moderators have the capacity to slow down these high energy neutrons. Water molecules present in the moderator are also instrumental in slowing down further the speed of high energy neutrons. The new reaction then takes place with the slowed down neutrons by striking them with fuel elements. A liquid or gas circulating through the core so as to transfer the heat from it. In light water reactors, moderator also functions as a coolant. Usually a robust steel vessel containing the reactor core and moderator or coolant, but it may be a series of tubes holding the fuel and conveying the coolant through the moderator another very important part of the nuclear reactor is the control rods we would like to have the steady flow of energy from the reaction isn't it for that purpose every single fission reaction leaves spare neutrons which in turn are utilized for more subsequent reactions the control over the spare neutrons available at any given time the rate of nuclear chain reaction can be controlled This control on fission reaction can be maintained using control rods. Control rods work by absorbing the excess or spare neutrons in the moderator to prevent any further fission reactions. These rods are usually made up of boron or cadmium. To increase the rate of reaction, the control rods can be removed by the moderator. A steady output of energy must be maintained by inserting or removing the control rods in the reactor. Apart from the above, three other important core components of a nuclear reactor are as follows: pressure vessel or pressure tubes, pressurizer, steam generator. Now that we have understood the various elements of the nuclear reactor, let us see the entire operations in the nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactor consists of a reactor core, pump and the heat exchanger. Due to the enormous amount of heat produced and then released during the fission process, surrounding water gets heated up and changes into steam. This steam turns the turbine 
thereby starting the generator which produces electricity lighting up our world.